The topic of uh, this afternoon is tips and tricks for hex bricks, brick meshing. Um, this is one of a series of different webinars that we've given over the last few years. Uh, we've also expanded our website recently. So take a look if you haven't been on there in a while. Uh, we have an expanded resource library. Uh, we also have a new engineering blog that we encourage you to uh, take a look at and post any comments or questions. Also, we have a series of upcoming uh, oh, 15 update seminars, so I encourage you to attend one of those. You can contact Chris for details on the specific one closest to your area. In terms of the previous posts and this webinar as well, uh, it will be future posted on the CA uh, YouTube account. So if you want to see some of the previous um, webinars we've done in the past, check those out, and this will be posted in the next uh, week or so as well. So the topic today is for hex and brick meshing. Um, so the question arises, uh, how effective are we in terms of brick meshing? And hopefully you will get some tips today that will help you or give you some confidence in the methodology you're incorporating. So the first thing with hex meshing is to identify does the model meet the topological requirements for hex meshing? We'll spend some time looking at some examples of there. Uh, then if things don't mesh, why don't they mesh? And maybe there's some tips that can help you in terms of uh, using various options to modify the geometry topology to enforce brick meshing, or in certain circumstances, maybe it's just not worth the extra effort and using a tetrahedron mesh in a portion or significant uh, areas of your model is not necessarily a bad thing. We'll spend some time talking about the two main sweep versus multi-zone methods for creating a hex mesh in ANSYS Mechanical, both have their pluses and minuses. They can both be used in conjunction with each other, and oftentimes that's the most efficient way of providing an analysis. And then, as I mentioned, the often the most uh, efficient method is combining hexahedral and tetrahedron meshes. So before we get into the details procedure, the first question to ask is, why do I need to use a hex mesh? Um, there is really nothing wrong with using an all-tetrahedron mesh. Uh, oftentimes that may be the best approach for very complex geometry, geometry that uh, is not amenable to sweeping, lots of little slivers and, and connections and joints and things that don't necessarily meet those requirements. But if we meet the topological requirements or if our geometry, geometry is amenable to it, then hex meshing typically is going to save us a lot of computational effort so we have less nodes and elements, so the time it takes for analysis to run is going to be significantly less. And often more important, we can actually physically solve the problem. Uh, if you mesh with all tetrahedron elements, you may reach the limits of the memory and resources that you have in terms of RAM and disk space to actually run your problems. The other thing that the hex meshing provides us is a much more controlled metrics in terms of the mesh that gets created. If we take a hex mesh and we just look at a, even a PowerPoint image, we can physically see the mesh on the outside and we can extrapolate what the mesh looks like on the inside. That's not the case with the tetrahedron meshes where you could see nice uniform perfectly shaped triangles on the outside and you could have some horribly shaped peak skewed elements on the inside. So those are some of the reasons why we use hex meshing. There are some examples of types of problems that we hex mesh. Uh, here are some examples of, for instance, a circuit board with a number of different uh, cooling fins and assembly and chips and etc. where these are parts are amenable to hex meshing because they have uniform uh, meshing geometry such that they have or we have the ability to identify or automatically identify a so-called source to target representation where we will sweep through the free mesh on a surface and create hexahedral elements through the depth of that sweep. 
Uh, the other examples shown there are the wheel hub with the brake, fairly complex model that's all hexahedral meshed, uh, bolted connections, uh, various different struts, lots of different functionality can be with some with little or some with no effort create a hexahedral mesh. So what kind of topology lends itself to hex mission, meshing? Well, anything that we have where we have a the ability to take a single source to a single target type representation. So some representations here of fairly thin wall part uh, show us the ability where we've created a hexahedral mesh by sweeping in various different orientations for these entities. The three bodies to the left were swept using the sweep meshing technique. The uh, clevis joint connection on the right was actually incorporated the multi-zone method. And as a general rule of thumb, no, no hard-coded things, because meshing is probably 50% capability and 50% art, but what I find is I recommend I usually use the slicing and the hex meshing for parts that are uniform, uh, generally fairly thin-walled structures, something where it's easy to make a few slices and create hex meshable regions. In more of a solid block type geometric entity, I'm more likely to try to incorporate the multi-zone method uh, for two reasons. One, it, it, it allows me a little more flexibility. The constraints on creating a hex mesh are less. It allows me to create a mesh where maybe 90% is hex and 10% is tets or even less than that. And it also works very well in conjunction with defining inflation layers if I want to force uh, thin layers on the boundary. And those can be done either for the CFD world, which is a more common application, but even in the structural world, getting thin layers near the boundary can be a useful method of evaluating the stress concentrations. So. What that brings us to is the first poll of the day. So Christina's going to put a poll out for everybody to uh, answer. And so the question is, what percent of the models that you currently work are hex meshed? And let's just get a kind of a feel for where everybody's at in terms of uh, the uh, meshing tools you use and whatnot. I mean, we have the questions from the extreme of uh, everything I do is all hexahedral mesh to the other extreme of uh, I just use tetrahedron elements. So give everybody a couple more seconds to, to fill out the poll. While you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up my first example problem that I want to show. So I'll do that and bring that up uh, in terms of the example. So what we have is uh, really everybody here is interested in hex mesh, so nobody's all tets, and probably most of the people it's about 50%. So that, that that's about the norm of kind of what I would see as well. So, um, so let's take this example part here. This is a tubular structure and let's say my goal is to create all hexahedral mesh in this part. So if I'm going to use a, all hexahedral mesh based on sweeping operations, one of the things I like to do if I have circular sections is I don't necessarily want to try to sweep mesh the full 360, but I have a lot of luck in splicing those bodies up because it gives me more control. It gives me control for specifying a number of divisions radially, et cetera. So, if I look, this particular tube was generated, or I have this plane 7 that was used as a starting point, so I'm going to generate a new plane from that. And I'm going to simply rotate that plane 90 degrees about the y-axis. And any time you're in the operation of doing slicing operations, you'll find that you'll very often create new planes and very often rotate the planes because the slicing tool is based on the xy plane. So I want to make sure the, the normal, the blue normal direction is going to be perpendicular to the surface that I'm going to slice. So if I take this section, the first thing I do is, is 
take this edge at the bottom of the smaller tube, and I'm going to extrude that. So I'm going to take that, extrude that section, and I'm going to use the slice material option. And for the direction, I've conveniently defined this coordinate system as a direction. And I'll go ahead and apply that, generate a slice, and now I've sliced my body uh, uh, so that I can get a hexahedral mesh in the tube section there. Now the other section cut I may make is a create a slice. So I'm going to create a slice operation, and I'm going to create a slice by this new plane that I created, this plane 10. And instead of slicing all the bodies, I'm going to select the body here for the tube, and then this little body underneath as well. I'm going to select that down. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and hold the control key down and generate this slice. So I slice the body. If I go back in and want to look at the final completed slice section you see here, here's my sliced body. I've sliced uh, based on the section, cut this into a couple different segments. And if I nick now at the hexahedral mesh that I created, here's my hexahedral mesh of my part. Now, by having this slice here, you notice it's very convenient. I can select this edge section here, and I can simply insert, in terms of the sizing operation, I'm going to insert a uh, number of divisions, for instance, so I could create two radial divisions along that interface and simply right-click. In version 15, it highlights the mesh that's going to be changed, so in orange, the obsolete mesh. So I right-click and say Generate Mesh, uh, and it simply throws away that mesh, creates the new hexahedral mesh in that particular region. So, back to the presentation. So, for sections that are amenable to slicing and dicing, I just showed two of the more common applications of slicing. There's other different slicing operations sometimes. Uh, we can select the edges around and create a loop and slice by a surface, etc. But those are probably the most too common is creating an edge and extruding it and taking a plane and slicing it to break our model up for hex meshing. For a little more complex structures or something where maybe I don't want to take the extra effort of changing the topology, I take this baseball bat example where I use the multi-zone method for this particular example, but I allowed it to make, if it needed to, any tetra elements in the core. And you can see by this section view here that it only created just a few little tets right at the, at the tip of the bat, but the rest of the bat is made continuously with hexahedral elements. Now, there are always going to be circumstances where, because of the complexity of the geometry, uh, the uh, slivers and gaps and fillets, uh, and, a, and a model where I'm looking at maybe just an overall glow response, let's say I just want the first couple modes of natural vibration, then I may actually instead use a pure tetrahedron type response. But if our part is a thin wall part, a part that has thin structure such that it's uh, amenable to a swept type mesh, then the hexahedral mesh gives us control in that we know exactly how many elements through the depth or through the thickness that will be represented throughout the entire body. And as you can see here, we can have relatively complex shapes and still easily with the hex meshing operations create a controlled mesh through that body. The other advantage, as we talked about earlier, from a computational effort of the hex mesh over the tetrahedral mesh, and this is exaggerated in this section, uh, the uh, example on the right here, where with the tetrahedral mesh, the element count and node count is significantly larger, factor of five or six greater than what we got with the hexahedral mesh. Now, in the hexahedral mesh here, we had the ability, or, or what was done was the mid-side nodes were dropped, um, because of the straight, flat, thin wall body, and maybe this was an example analysis where I want to predict plasticity, where I still get the same number of integration points in the hexahedral mesh that I get with 
the lower order hexahedral elements versus the higher order hexahedral elements. So I can save some computational effort and still get the accuracy I need. Now there are certain circumstances where you have a model that you think is hex meshable, but for some reason or not, it does not hex mesh. And often the case is an issue with the topology, and commonly what looks like a, a geometry that will mesh may not mesh because there may be some hidden or these little vertices or little slivers that eliminate the uh, option of sweep meshing because it doesn't meet the topology requirements. So my next demo example is just that, is a case where we're going to look at an example of something that if I take the geometry as is, which looks like it should meet the requirements for sweep mesh, and simply say generate a mesh, is it generates a tetrahedra mesh. And if I turn on the vertices, look at my geometry, and start spinning around, I notice that I've created a situation where I have a little sliver here, and I see my clearly there's a vertice there, so I need to do something different to get a hexahedral mesh in this particular body. Well, we have a couple options. We could just take the body as is and insert a method and select my body and change my method to the multi zone method and do nothing else and just say generate mesh. And the multi zone method has a nice thing is that it will go ahead and pave over those initial points there and give us a nice hexahedral mesh. So it went through and did a auto defeaturing and gave us this hexahedral mesh. If I don't want to take advantage of that, I'm worried about that maybe changing my topology, I can go ahead and well, I'll delete the uh, multi-zone method and go back in in the model and I'm going to insert some virtual topology. And so I can see that the issue is these two surfaces here. So I'm going to insert a virtual cell on those two surfaces. And now, if I clear the mesh, just to show that I'm starting over from scratch, and generate a mesh, is that now I get the nice hexahedral mesh with the option of using the virtual topology. Of course, I could also have gone back into uh, Design Modeler or Space Claimer or CAD system and combined those surfaces as well. But sometimes it's advantageous if you've gone through the process of things like setting up all your contacts and whatnot, is that I don't want to have to go back to geometry. I just want to make the changes as is in the mechanical suite to force the hexahedral mesh. So I'll go back to the uh, presentation. And one thing I did not mention the, at the top, but there will be option for some questions and answers. So uh, go ahead and submit any questions to the chat window, and we'll cover those at the end of the half-hour WebEx presentation. So the example we just showed where we had the uh, sweeping did not occur, but using multi-zone or defeaturing allowed us to create a swept mesh. And one of the nice advantages of the multi zone, in addition to that defeaturing option, is it will also block our model for hex meshing automatically. So whereas this geometry shown here with the four posts would require some slicing and dicing for a swept mesh, we can hex mesh this with the multi-zone just by inserting the multi-zone method. And then often advantageous by specifying so-called source entities where the sources can be both sources and targets. So when you specify the manual source region, these can be source regions, and they can also be the corresponding targets. Another advantage of the multi-zone method is that when it performs the free mesh on the surface that it's going to extrude, we have two different options in terms of the type of mesh it's going to create. We can use the uniform method, which is more defining all our elements the same size, maybe more better suited for modal or explicit dynamics type analysis. Or if we're looking at stress concentrations, we can look at the PAVE method, which will force a uh, refined mesh around curvature sections, as you can see in this example 
between the two option settings on this part in the PowerPoint. Now, the multi-zone method is still meeting the same requirements for a swept type mesh as the sweep mesh option by itself. The difference is, is that the multi-zone will do some of the blocking operations automatically for you. So you see this example here is that anytime we have a swept type mesh, we need to have a free fat face source and target that can be swept through our structure. They may be swept, in this case, they may be swept actually, they may be swept, swept longitudinally, and sometimes we need to provide some guidance for the software to figure out how it should best sweep that particular geometry and body. So some examples, a simplified example here where the source and target, we specify maybe the operation to sweep from the circular regions, and you notice that the using the automatic version, uh, mechanical is very capable of going ahead and creating an all brick mesh in this particular geometry example without any user interaction. Now, if we take the same geometry and we add a fillet radius here on the end of our body, now we don't meet that same requirement. We can't sweep this section through our part. We can still go ahead and use the multi-zone method, but we can incorporate a free mesh in the core using either tetrahedron elements or you can use this free mesh with hexacore where it makes a tet interface between the core and the external surface. So we have bricks on the outside, then tets, then bricks, or bricks and then tets in the case of the free mesh tetra. So an example of controlling our mesh, maybe we can control the mesh by doing the slicing and dicing operation we described earlier in the design modeler product. We can also make modifications directly in the mechanical product, and the example I want to show is taking the multi-zone method. So if I take the multi-zone method for this particular geometry, ANSYS is not able to parse this automatically and create an all brick mesh. But if I insert some virtual topology, and in the virtual topology option, if I select an edge, and I select my cursor at edge, I can cut my model using the split edge operation. And so I'm gonna slice that edge and create some discrete points, and I'm gonna use those points as an operation to control my mesh settings. So I'll just go ahead and do a couple here just to kind of demonstrate the functionality of this. So I split these edges. Then what I can do is take the vertex select, and if I select two vertices, I can then use the split face along an edge, and if I repeat the process on the other side here, or I can select this vertex here and this vertex down here. Actually, I kind of moved it a little bit out of the way, but we can still do it. So we can say split this face like this, and now you notice that I've created multiple surfaces on the boundary. So rather than working on the interactive session, I'll go ahead and go to the completed section where I did a little better job in terms of slicing my model up. And if I look at the mesh controls here, I have a nice all hexahedral mesh created on this body where the slicing was done purely just with the virtual topology of cutting edges and surfaces. In addition to forcing the mesh as the method as multi-zone, also as part of this example, I use an inflation layer. So for the multi-zone, we told it that it was a hex mesh only and use two faces so the mesh would predominantly sweep from the two red surfaces and then by using inflation and selecting the, all the external faces I created a mesh where if I look at the actual mesh you notice I got the thin inflation layer on the two tubes with three layers each. And if I want to look at the core mesh inside here I could go ahead and take this section and cut it and look at the mesh on the inside, 
And if you go in the section plane and turn on the whole element, it shows you a little clearly what the element shapes look like. So we can use the options in virtual topology to slice our mesh. And here's another example in 2D. I can go ahead and slice and give me control of forcing a certain number of elements in each of the fillet radiuses as shown in this particular example. We can also create a hybrid mesh where sometimes circumstances such as the region in the center of the platform area is sweepable in the longitudinal direction. However, the ends, because we have these different fillet radiuses on the ends, it's really not amenable to a hexahedral mesh. So in this example, these regions will be uh, hex or tet meshed and the sweep mesh operations will be used in the remainder of the blade assembly. Now, how does ANSYS do these transitions? Well, it uses, if I, let's say I was using a lower order element in the core, it would make the lower order brick elements in the core, it would drop mid-side nodes on the exterior face of the brick elements and such that it would have the extra uh, mid-side noded elements that align themselves with both the pyramid and tetrahedron elements in the free mesh section of my model. If I'm using higher order bricks, I just have a continuation. I have the pyramids and the tets all with higher order elements throughout my structure. So going back to this example, for this example, the topology for sweep meshing is met for the two subsections created by slicing the platform body and by the base structure, but the two blades don't meet the topology because the source to target is multiple faces. However, the multi-zone mesh will go ahead and account for that automatically and combine those surfaces so I can go ahead and directly mesh the blades with just selecting the multi-zone option. And here's the completed mesh, which is a combination of tetrahedrons and brick elements. Those of you that will attend the upcoming version 15 will get a lot more details on new functionality, but one of the big things that ANSYS has done with version 15 is increased the computational speed in a number of the bottlenecks of the process for meshing and model uh, modifications. So you can now take a account of multiple processors in terms of, for instance, the meshing algorithms will go ahead and mesh each of the individual bodies with different cores to dramatically speed up the process of creating a whole hexahedral mesh.